In this section of the lecture, I'm going to ask, why did the Industrial Revolution happen? This is perhaps the most contentious question in economic history. 250 years after the start of the event, economic historians are still vigorously debating the answers to this question. One reason, I think, why there's still debate going on is that it's a big question. In fact, I think it's probably best thought of as several questions. One question is what explains how the original inventions were made. A second question is what explains the continuous process of improvement of those inventions, inventions and their adoption in production. Another question is why does the initial stage of the Industrial Revolution feed into persistent and accelerating technological innovation after that time? Another question is, why did the Industrial Revolution happen at the particular time it did? And a final question, or questions, is why did it happen first in England? Why not somewhere else in Europe? Or why not, as we'll talk about in the next section of this lecture, in China? I think the other reason why there's ongoing debate about this question is that many of the contributors to the debate have sought to think in terms of one major explanation for the Industrial Revolution. So as uh, the economic historian Max Hartwell said, it's fair to say that historians in their detailed analyses of the Industrial Revolution have suggested many causal factors, yet nearly all have sought a main cause and have elevated one variable explicitly or implicitly to the role of chief cause. So often the uh, research on the reasons for the Industrial Revolution has involved competing versions of what the one main cause was. In this part of the lecture, I'm going to take a more eclectic approach, presenting um, a variety of explanations for the Industrial Revolution um, that have um, been put forward. So um, some of these explanations would be um, disputed um, by some proponents um, in the debate, some would be supported by those um, same proponents. Uh, but um, my objective is to try to give you a reasonable overview of the variety of explanations that have been presented for why the Industrial Revolution uh, occurred. I'm going to start with the idea of, of knowing how to invent. Knowing how to invent is the idea that advances in science or advances in the method of doing science were important in explaining the Industrial Revolution. Here I've included a quote from um, Jack Goldstone, um, which I think nicely um, summarises this idea of knowing how to invent. So he says, in late 17th century Britain, a new and distinctive pattern of social relations and interaction arise. Natural philosophers aim to unlock the secrets of nature by publicly presented demonstrations with instruments that reliably revealed regular relationships in nature. Craftspeople sought to learn the latest news of chemistry and mechanics, visiting mechanics libraries, which sprang up all over uh, Britain, and to use these insights to create new tools and machines. Entrepreneurs and industrialists sought to join with craftspeople and scientifically trained or literate engineers to create new products or promotion processes. I think this quote is capturing a variety of features of what you might think of as, as knowing how to um, invent. What the economic historian who's been most associated with this idea, Joel McKeer, has called the industrial enlightenment. First of all, I think you get from this quote the idea that science could be directed towards the, the deliberate endeavour of imp improving human knowledge about natural phenomena. Secondly, the idea that the method you would use to do that was by using, uh, by using experiments. Thirdly, that the best sort of knowledge to be seeking was knowledge that would be useful, in particular useful to um, industry um, or useful to improving the condition of um, humankind in some way. Fourthly, the idea that um, knowledge should be accessible. Um, so the idea that there were uh, mechanics libraries where um, craftspeople um, could go to learn about new developments in science, chemistry for example, um, and mechanics. And, and fifthly, while 
this certainly wasn't a phenomenon that had spread through the whole of the English population, that it had diffused through a variety of groups who would be critical to bringing technological um, invention. That is, it wasn't only scientists sort of who um, were adopting this new approach to thinking about knowledge, but it was also craftspeople and it was also entrepreneurs and industrialists who took on um, this, um, this approach. The motivation for directing attention to invention seems to have been a combination of the professional reputation that could be gained from achieving uh, new inventions and also um, financial return. With that balance probably varying between um, scientists, craftspeople and uh, entrepreneurs. So that um, scientists um, probably put more weight on uh, professional reputation, um, recognition such as uh, membership of the Royal Society and entrepreneurs would have put more value on the financial return that could have come from engaging in this type of activity. How much um, of why the Industrial Revolution happened can knowing how to invent explain? John McKeer, who's been the main proponent of the idea of the Industrial Enlightenment uh, being important, doesn't necessarily think that it can explain um, all of the inventions that um, started off the Industrial Revolution. He says that most of the great macro inventions of the 1770s and 1780s were the result of the dexterian ingenuity of British mechanics and not of what he calls the Baconian program of experimental science. But he does think that what the Industrial Enlightenment did was to create the change in attitude amongst um, scientists, craftspeople and entrepreneurs that meant their attention was hereafter uh, always directed towards thinking in terms of technological um, improvement. In terms of the question of um, why the Industrial Revolution happened in England, well, one argument that's been proposed is that the Industrial Enlightenment was something that happened um, in England, but not in the rest of um, um, Europe. That in Europe, um, the sort of, sort of more mathematical, um, logical approach to science of Descartes um, still reigned supreme and that was something that um, might have stymied um, invention in the rest of Europe. But in fact, you know, there were um, lots of um, uh, inventions in the rest of Europe. In fact, one of um, the, the strengths of um, England was its ability to be open to taking inventions from um, other parts of um, Europe. So if the Industrial Enlightenment was, was something that um, was more widespread um, in Europe, then it, it seems more likely that the explanation for why England is particular um, factors such as the fact that um, England was more politically stable at the end of the 18th century um, and um, early 19th century than um, other parts of Europe, in particular, um, say, um, France. Now, Knowing how to invent can provide a, a general explanation for why there might have been more technological invention um, in a country or society, but it doesn't really tell us about the, the type of inventions um, which occurred. That's um, something which has been a, a major concern of the economic historian um, Robert Allen. He's begun by noting that there were particular features of the British economy during the 18th century. That it was a high wage and cheap energy economy. That British wages were higher than in other countries. That British wages were high relative to the price of um, physical capital equipment in Britain. And that British wages were high relative to the price of energy in Britain, in particular um, coal. And so he's argued that what that means is that there were the greatest incentives for the invention of technologies that disproportionately saved labour because it was this expensive input and instead used capital and energy because they were um, relatively um, cheaper um, inputs. And so Alan argues that this can explain the um, process of um, technological um, invention and diffusion that we see in Europe because it was only 
England, which had these high wages and cheap capital and energy costs. That's why the Industrial Revolution starts in England. Of course, once the original inventions are made, um, the creation of um, steam engine, um, creation of um, new methods for producing cotton textiles, what happened, as I described, is that those inventions were continually refined. What that refinement did was to continually reduce the costs of using those methods of producing. And so eventually, those technologies became cheap enough that even in countries in Europe which had wages that were lower, it was still the case that the technologies became relatively cheap compared to the cost of using labour. And that's when places like France, for example, jumped to start using um, these new technologies. Allen, for example, points out that um, Cugnot in, in France had invented a, ste a steam um, engine, and, um, but it wasn't taken up in the same way um, that it was in um, England. And his argument for why that is, is that um, the price of um, coal um, was so much higher in France than in, um, than in England. Now, it does seem to be the case that having high wages and uh, cheap energy imply that entrepreneurs and industrialists would have wanted to adopt new technologies that were labour saving. So this new method of production that meant that they had to use less of an input that was more relatively more expensive labour and instead allowed them to substitute inputs that were cheaper, capital and energy, is something that made their businesses more profitable. But it doesn't necessarily follow that high wage, cheap energy economy is an economy that would have directed inventors' attention towards labour saving technology. In that an invention that saves labour is going to save money, but so is an invention that saves capital or saves energy. Now one area where it does seem that there are other factors that would have directed inventors' attention in this high wage, cheap energy environment towards inventing labour saving technology is in the cotton textile um, sector. And here um, the driving force was competition, um, competition from India. In the um, 17th century there were increasing cotton imports, um, textile imports to England from India via the um, East India uh, Company. Uh, the reason um, those imports were bought by um, English consumers is that they were relatively cheap because um, labour in India was relatively cheap compared to uh, labour um, in England. Now, producers of woolen and linen cloth in England at the time were unhappy with this competition. They lobbied the government and the government imposed protection against import of um, cotton textiles from India from 1701 to 1774. That gave a long window in which English cotton textile manufacturers were able to establish themselves in selling to the English domestic market. But of course, English cotton textile producers, because they're having um, high costs of labour, um, weren't competitive against Indian cotton textile manufacturers in the rest of the world. That was only going to happen if England could find new methods of producing cotton textiles that got round the high labour costs. In other words, they needed technologies that saved labour and instead used more capital and used more energy intensive methods of production if they were going to be able to reduce the cost of producing cotton textile to allow them to compete with India. And the argument is that, that that's what um, then happened, that it was this um, desire to compete with India in supplying cotton textile to the, the rest of the world that directed the attention of inventors towards labour saving technology in this sector. This table just gives some data on um, uh, British imports and exports of cotton goods. You can see that in the late 17th century imports from India um, are much higher um, than um, exports um, um, of cotton um, textiles from um, England. Um, when you get towards the end of the um, 
uh, or sorry, the start of the industrial, the period of the industrial revolution, they're sort of um, in balance. But quickly, once the industrial revolution gets underway, you see that the, the numbers really reverse. Here in England, you've got increasing exports of cotton goods, whereas in India, you've got decreasing imports to Britain. And so the idea here is that as you get these new technologies being um, in, invented in England that reduce the cost of producing cotton, England is increasingly able to sell onto a world market and the demand for imports from a place like India um, decreases. Here's a graph which makes the point about the change in relative costs of production being a driver of England being increasingly competitive as a cotton textile producer. So there's data from 1680 to 1820. Each of these numbers is England relative to India where India is benchmarked at 100. So this is telling you, for example, that wages in England in 1680 were four times the level of wages in India, 400 to 100. And you can see, for example, that right through this period, wages in England remain well above wages in India. So England is an expensive place for labour relative to um, India. You can see that um, because of um, the, the, the raw price of cotton also is relatively expensive in England compared to India, uh, particularly in 1770 and 1790 when there's um, an increase in demand for cotton in England when uh, manufacturing of cotton textile is getting underway, that causes an increase um, in price. You can see the rental price of capital um, about the same, then sort of falling. If we look at the, the, the total um, factor um, input price, so this is sort of a combination of um, the different um, inputs waiting for their um, relative usage, you can see how um, that um, is decreasing from 1790 um, to 1820. You can also see how the price at which um, cotton was able to be sold from England relative to India, in 1790 the price of cotton free on board is higher than in India, but by 1820 the price at which cotton is able to be sold has fallen below that in India. What that means is that over the whole of this period there's this continual increase in the productive efficiency in production of cotton in India, sorry, in England, in England compared to in India. So in 1680 the productivity of producing cotton um, in India compared to England was pretty similar. But by 1820, England's improved its efficiency about threefold compared to um, uh, resource usage to the amount of output that's produced in England. So through the technological developments in England during this period, there was this very rapid improvement in productivity. That rapid improvement in productivity allows England to sell its cotton at a low price and to become um, thereby um, more competitive on world, world markets. Now, in that last part of the discussion, I mentioned about the idea that um, policy was somewhat important in directing English attention towards um, the textile sector, the, the, the restrictions on imports of um, English textiles. That raises the broader question of the role of institutions and the incentive to invent that they create. Now, there are some sort of specific factors that at various times have been suggested to have been important in fostering invention in, in England. One of them is the English patent system. The, the other feature is security of property rights. It's, it's, for example, argued that after the glorious revolution of 1688, um, the introduction of parliamentary democracy imposed restrictions on the capacity of the crown to renege on borrowing. That created greater trust in capital markets and allowed interest rates to be lower in, in a way that um, improved access to borrowing. Now, there have been um, critiques of both those sort of particular approaches. So, for example, with patents, when you look at English inventions at the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition, only 10% of the British exhibits were patented. Until 1852, it was expensive to take out a patent and patents were frequently in, infringed or had caveats um, put on them. With regard to security of property rights, 
there's been a range of empirical analysis that suggested that um, certainly um, the glorious revolution doesn't seem to have had a major effect on um, interest rates in, um, in British um, credit markets. That isn't to say, though, that the general institutional framework in England wasn't important for explaining why the Industrial Revolution occurred. In, instead, it, it seems important to recognise that there was a particular orientation of policy making in England which probably helped to promote um, the incentive to invest. Um, on different views, the Enlightenment or, or the Glorious Revolution directed government policy making to promoting new technology um, and industrial um, growth. Um, so for example, an argument is that the um, Enlightenment um, thought was partly directed against um, rent-seeking activity and that caused um, government to uh, reduce, um, to, to act against rent-seeking activity that might have otherwise stymied invention. For example, the government were refusing to um, act on petitions that were asking them to um, stop various technological um, inventions, um, new, new inventions during this period being introduced into, um, into industry. Um, with the Glorious Revolution, the argument is that this increased the role of um, Parliament in policy making and the Whigs being the dominant party at the time, it meant that um, policy making was increasingly directed towards um, economic growth um, and to um, fostering um, industry and commercial um, activity. One particular um, example, um, during this period, the, the um, 18th century, is legislation allowing reorganisation of property rights, of which, of which one example is statutory authority. So there's increasing legislation um, bringing into being statutory authorities, such as turnpike trusts. Um, turnpike trusts were extremely important um, in um, providing um, road improvements, which led to improved market integration through um, uh, road, road tolls. A fourth possible um, explanatory factor for the Industrial Revolution is, is international trade. And there's been a variety of ways in which it's suggested that international trade uh, might have driven the Industrial Revolution. One way is by providing a larger market for manufactured goods. A second way is by providing access to raw materials, so um, broadening the access to um, food and raw materials such as um, raw cotton in a way that let Britain specialise more in manufacturing activity um, without um, increasing the price of foodstuffs and um, raw materials. The um, international trade, uh, the, the development of international trade led to developments of ports and the shipping and finance sector um, in England. It's, it's been argued, um, the, the, the well-known Williams hypothesis was the argument that profits from the slave trade um, underpinned um, investment um, in capital equipment by industrialists in the Industrial um, uh, Revolution. That idea, and the reason I've got the question mark there, the idea that profits from the slave trade um, underpin the Industrial Re Revolution um, is probably not thought of as a major factor um, currently, but it's still the case that the slave trade obviously was extremely important in um, the provision of uh, raw materials such as foodstuff and raw cotton to um, England. There's also the idea that international trade had indirect effects, that it made Britain a high wage economy, hence feeding into the idea that that was one of the reasons um, driving technological invention in Britain, and also that international trade changed the balance of political power in Britain, that it was associated with giving greater power to the merchant commercial class, and hence that class being more influential in the v development of economic policy, particularly after the Glorious Revolution. If we look at the, the composition of English trade in the period during the Industrial um, Revolution, we see um, that um, exports of cotton goods became increasingly important during um, this period. We see that um, Britain also during this period 
was trading with a wider variety of um, countries. So back in 1784, all of what it was exporting was going to sort of old markets that it had been trading with. But increasingly, as um, time goes on, Britain's trading with um, new markets um, as well. If you look at um, imports, you can see that um, imports are largely about um, raw materials, so always over about 45 up to 60% of um, British imports are raw materials, which are going to be used in industrial um, production. Um, and um, also um, foodstuffs were important, although sort of diminishingly so um, over the period. So if we look at sort of what the composition of English trade was, we see sort of some basis for thinking that the first two points on the previous slide, markets for manufactured exports and imports of food and raw materials, may have been important for um, English um, economic development during this period. That's an impression that is reinforced if we look at research which has actually tried to calculate how much effect it would have had on British income if international trade had been um, cut off. Um, so um, Greg Clark, Kevin O'Rourke and, Al and Alan Taylor have done the exercise in what's called a general equilibrium model of simulating the effects of cutting off Britain from international trade, both in 1760 and 1850. What they find is that, um, first of all, in 1760, before the Industrial Revolution really happens, cutting off international trade from Britain wouldn't have had a huge effect on um, the level of real income in Britain. So if you cut off trade with the New World, about minus 2%. Rest of the world, minus 1.7%. Um, no trade with the whole world, minus 3%. So an appreciable but not gigantic effect. But when we come to the um, period at the end of the Industrial Revolution, we find cutting off trade with the New World would have had some effect, you know, not a huge effect, given the importance that's often attached to it. Cutting off trade with the rest of the world, this is sort of, for example, other countries in Europe, would have had a somewhat larger effect. But if you don't allow England to trade at all, then it reduces its income compared to, if it's allowed to trade, by almost 30%. So Clark, O'Rourke and Taylor say that what international trade means is that rather than um, income in England increasing by about 45% in the period from 1760 to 1850, without international trade, it would have only increased by um, 5%. So international trade may not have been the direct source of technological invention during this period, but it certainly facilitated the implementation of that technology, te new technologies, um, allowing Britain to specialise in industry and import foodstuffs in raw materials that, ac that accounts for um, a large share of the growth in um, income in Britain during this period. Another important point is we've just talked about international trade. It's also important to recognise that Britain had, by international standards, a large local or domestic market to sell to. So high incomes in Britain had created ex an expanded market for um, consumption goods. Um, this supported an improvement in the range of quality of goods that were sold and product innovation in the form of decoration and um, ornamentation. Maxine Berg has calculated between 1627 and 1825, 30 per cent of the patents that were taken out in England applied to goods like uh, metalware, glassware, ceramics, furniture, clocks, watches, and also processes to do with decoration and ornamentation. So it's of no little importance that Britain was a consumer economy towards which the new type of industrial products that were being produced could be directed. The final point I want to talk about is the British workforce. It also seems that the British workforce contributed to there being an industrial revolution. And there's three dimensions in which we can talk about a British workforce. The first dimension is to talk about the, the entrepreneurs, the, the industrialists who put together the ventures that would 
use the new technologies that would um, produce, um, produce output. Um, John McKeon makes the point that most of these entrepreneurs were um, predominantly British and, and predominantly middle class. In their orientation towards um, industry, towards productive activity, you can think that this derived from perhaps um, attitudes in British society that put weight on um, production, put weight on um, making money as a type of achievement. Another approach to thinking about the development of this class of entrepreneurs is to think of it as due to evolutionary dynamics. That over time what had been happening in Britain was that um, richer classes had been having more children um, than poorer classes and so over time you ended up with a situation where there was an increasingly large proportion of the population who had uh, middle class um, values. It's also the case that Britain was very well off with skilled um, craftsmen and these skilled craftsmen were very important in the process of translating, um, creating and translating you know, inventions, new science into machinery that could be used in, um, in industry. Um, there was, for example, the, the group of um, watch and clock makers who had the extensive knowledge of um, gears and mechanics. There were mining engineers who had knowledge of um, uh, transport, who had knowledge of um, hydraulics. Um, and there were naval um, engineers as well. And this group of steel craftsmen were um, promoted in England by the apprenticeship system and the guild system. England also had what's often referred to as an industrious working class. Um, and, and there's a range of reasons that have been suggested for why the working class was industrious. From Weber's idea that the Protestant work ethic made people in England work hard, to theories that um, the bringing of coffee to England meant that um, people were now able to um, orient themselves to a regular working schedule. Probably the most plausible explanation for there being an industrious working class in England was that calorie intake at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution seems to have been higher in England than other parts of Europe and that would have made the English working class more um, productive. So in this section of the lecture I've tried to give you a feel for the variety of factors that have been proposed as important for explaining the Industrial Revolution. In the next section, I'm going to move on to talk about a more specific question, which is why the Industrial Revolution didn't happen in China.